well thank you everybody um for hanging around if you were here this morning and thank you for coming and giving it part of your saturday to to join us as we continue our um conversation about teaching independence uh opening the the communication or bridging the communication gap so we this morning we were talking um about uh monuments and memory which turned out to be a, a, an extremely fruitful conversation about um how place um can be used in education and uh particularly in education about the revolution and so this afternoon we're shifting to a more conceptual approach me versus we and i think if you were at the round table yesterday in the mcneil center you'll have heard me credit this uh wonderful turn of phrase to adrienne whaley who's on the uh panel today this is what this is her we, we, and it is it, it's a it's a great way of um of conceptualizing uh this idea of of individual freedom and community responsibility that is of course you know baked into the republican experiment so we're hoping that our um uh, our panel this afternoon um is going to we're going to explore the language of, of rights and responsibility inclusion and exclusion in the declaration and uh, more broadly in early america and we had a, a wonderful suite of presenters to take us through that I'm now going to hand over to uh, John Zimmerman, uh, who is a professor in the Graduate School of Education at Penn, who will be your moderator for this afternoon's uh, proceedings. Thanks, Emma, and thanks to everyone who's joining, and especially for our two presenters. Um, I, too, uh, really like the title, Me, The, We, and I should tell you that I told my wife the title this morning. She said, well, that's not a dilemma for you. It's, it's always me over we. Uh, and I said, yeah, but historically, I mean, there's more of a dilemma, I think, and that's what we'll be exploring today. We've got two great, um, uh, uh, great presenters. Um, uh, we're going to hear from Jessica Roney, who's a professor of history at Temple University. Um, I've never met Jessica, but I'm a big admirer of her work, and I'm delighted that she's here. And then um, we'll hear from Adrian Whaley, who uh, is the Director of Engagement and Community Education at the Museum of the American Revolution. So if it's okay with our speakers, I know there's a tyranny of the alphabet, and since I'm a Zimmerman, I'm almost always last. But if we could proceed in alphabetical order with first Jessica and then Adrian, that would be great. So, so please, uh, Jessica, take it away. Okay. Um, I will need to share my screen. Just give me a second to get uh, to do this. Sorry, it, it's thinking. <laughs> it happens. Oh dear. I wonder if you should start with Adrienne, just because my computer is, now it's blurring out your window altogether. Oh, okay. That's totally fine. And well, uh, if it's okay by Adrienne. Oh no, uh, now it says did, you've did started. It it? There it is. Okay, okay. Then I will go, okay. Great. Well, hi, and thank you for having me. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. I am thinking, uh, so the way I pitched my um, contribution to this conversation is thinking about the American Revolution in a really big story way. Um, this is something that, uh, so I, I think of uh, Adrienne as sort of doing the bottom up. I'm trying to do a little bit more of the top down, and hopefully together that gives some ideas for how we might approach um, teaching the American Revolution. So um, the, at its core, <laughs> teaching about the American Revolution or any other subject is, uh, at its core, it's um, about storytelling. And I realize this is not set up to go. There we go. So to start the story, um, narratives work really well when you have a single protagonist, when you start with one voice, one vision, one perspective. Um, it's clear, it's unmuddled, or at least as unmuddled as a single human can be. And so here we have an artist imagining Thomas Jefferson pondering how to write the Declaration of Independence. So we can tell the revolution from this standpoint, and this has often been done. But of course, he didn't operate alone, and we know that. But it's not so hard to accommodate, and for the narrative to accommodate the Continental Congress, 
or the other actors who worked with him. It requires some work because these men came from many different colonies, perspectives, and interests. But in the end, they quote unquote hung together as uh, in Jefferson's colorful phrase fairly well. Uh, moving out of doors requires a bigger stretch. Now we're thinking about a larger array of interests and perspectives, including those of socioeconomic class. These men did not necessarily agree with their leaders in all things and pushed for some different outcomes, uh, sometimes in, through violence, um, including in Philadelphia. And over time, historians have broadened and broadened the story to include more and more voices, including women across lines of race and class, indigenous Americans protecting their ancestral homelands, African Americans fighting on both sides of the conflict, and of course, loyalists. Well, this story is much more crowded. <laughs> it's much more confusing, even cacophonous. It's difficult to get a clean, clear narrative because there are so many different voices, so many different narrators insisting on their place. And for much of American history, we told the story of the revolution and beyond as one of progress. And that story is easier if you pick a single or narrow perspective, but it gets harder the more um, perspectives you add in because one person's progress might be another person's, not affect another person at all, or it might in fact harm another person. So where we once looked narrowly and claimed universality, now historians are much more likely to look broadly and make claims more narrowly. And I was thinking about this, um, let me just check the chat. Can you, let me fix my audio. Can you hear me better now? Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, so I was thinking about this sort of uh, distinction between perspectives and how, how a narrow perspective leads to one kind of outcome and a broader one to a different one. And I was thinking about it, um, I actually, it was at dinner. <laughs> I was at a, a restaurant in South Philadelphia, very nice restaurant, very crowded. And by dessert, we were having a conversation with the couple next to us. And the man uh, sitting next to me, was, when he found out I was a historian, he was very interested. He said, well, I wanna ask you about how historians are interpreting George Washington today. Like, do you think it's fair to judge him by our modern perspective on being a slave owner or should we judge him by the standards of his own time? You know, is it, is it fair for us to be so upset about him being a slave owner? And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, where George Washington lived, 50% of the population was enslaved. So if we are in fact going to leave, leave it to contemporaries and sort of how they thought about it, we would have to include their understanding of whether or not slavery was a moral or just outcome as well. And he kind of thought about that. He hadn't, when he expected a different answer, he wasn't expecting me to, um, widen the lens and think about a much broader audience, even if we're looking at it by the standards of his own time. And so we didn't get into any kind of fight about George Washington or whether or not he's, how to feel about him. But I, I hope that he walked away from the conversation thinking a little bit differently about even if we're judging him on his own, the standards of his own day, how then do we, um, like how might we think about that more broadly? So where does this leave us with our narrative? Um, how do we tell or teach a story that just does justice to them all. And as I was trying to say earlier, I think it gets into a question of sort of a bottom up narrative, which has the benefit of specificity, audiences and students identify strongly with biography, but it can leave out or blur other narratives. So another approach is the top down narrative. Um, traditionally, as I said, this story has been told as one of progress, um, even if that progress had to extend, extend over a great deal of time um, through the Civil War into the 20th century with the 19th Amendment and uh, civil rights movement, for example. So some argue, so this is, the, that's the story I sort of grew up with, this story of progress. But more recently, there's been a, so, a story of the founding uh, that goes in a really different direction. It says that instead of progress or sort of the beginning of progress, the founding planted the seeds of the discord and inequity that we're now facing right now. We're looking around and we're seeing all these problems. We're saying, where did these come from? Were they always present? Were they present from the beginning? 
Well, I don't have an answer to that question, but I do want to share how I have been teaching about the American Revolution. And it's an approach that resonates with my students. And I think reframes in the same way that in that dinner conversation did, it reframes to, to try and broaden the lens and think in a really global perspective about what is happening and how we might understand its significance. Um, so I teach the American Revolution as a global event. And just to uh, forecast, I'm going to give you five points here, and, and that'll be it. Um, I do want to specify, though, or, or clarify, I'm not talking about the American Revolution sort of in a, um, a, as a comparative approach. There's a long scholarly literature on the comparative and lineal relationship of the American Revolution to other Atlantic uh, revolutions, including those in France, Ireland, Haiti, and Latin America. And while that's valuable, that's not what I'm trying to do here. So here are my five contentions. The first is the conflict in the American Revolution was, or the American War for Independence, was not bilateral, but multilateral. Often we teach this as, uh, we narrow into this conflict as a, a fight between the colonists and England and leave it at that. And we debate its causes, its significance, all of the rest of it, why people fought in it, why they didn't on that on that register, on that bilateral sort of uh, uh, register. But a lot of the most exciting recent scholarship has challenged us to pivot the world map. And instead of understanding the American Revolution as an internal dispute between Britain and some of her colonies, instead positioning it in a much broader scope, taking account of the other powers that were involved. For example, uh, the French <laughs> were an important part of why the Americans were able to win the war, and they were not at all in concerned about British taxation or whether or not the colonists uh, uh, had self-determination. They didn't care about any of that. They were bitter at Britain and wanted revenge, uh, and this is part of a long 18th century where Britain and France are almost uh, about half the time in one war or another, and the American Revolution can be seen as another um, episode in a long history of warfare between them. So they're not interested in the political claims one way or the other or, or anti-monarchical uh, politics. They are interested in geopolitics and, and how they position themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Britain. Likewise, Spain, which never entered the war on the side of the Americans, but did come in as an ally to the French, was absolutely opposed to colonial independence because, of course, they had their own colonies to worry about. They didn't want this dangerous precedent to be set. But they, too, saw the American War for Independence as a way to get uh, uh, territory and strike back at Britain in, in the North American continent to pursue their own interests. Some of the most important uh, participants in the revolution were indigenous nations. Nations east of the Mississippi River found themselves enmeshed in this war, whether they wanted to be or not. Most of them tried to stay neutral and few of them were able to uh, succeed in that. They, they got drawn into the conflict one way or another. But in every case, they acted on behalf of their own goals on the preservation of their homelands and their sovereignty. And we've long recognized that the indigenous war for independence did not begin in 1776, and it did not end in 1783, but instead, in fact, entered a new phase of intensity as the American, what we call the American Revolution or the war for independence came to a close. So if we leave out all of these actors, we're actually leaving out a large number of the combatants. All right, the second contention that helps me think about the American Revolution. British America endured. It did not end with the American Revolution. Um, when we teach about the American Revolution, this is the map you're most likely to see in a textbook uh, uh, or, or Google, and this is what you'll find. But this is actually not accurate. The British Empire in 1775 looked like this. It had more than 30 colonies, some of them quite recent, some of them very, very old, and only some of them joined the rebellion. That none of them liked the Stamp Act, none of them liked these policies in the 1760s, and they all protested at that time, but not all of them left. And so that leads to some really interesting questions uh, that you can ask students about why some colonies revolted and others, despite having the same protests, the same objections to taxation without representation, why they stayed in the empire despite similar political um, ideals 
or why a colony like Georgia, which in some ways has the same kinds of uh, military concerns as colonies in the Caribbean, why Georgia joined the other 12 colonies that did uh, leave. It also helps us to remember that uh, the when Britain lost colonies in the American War for Independence, it lost 15, not 13 colonies. Uh, two of them significantly went to the Spanish Empire. Uh, back then, Florida was two different colonies. It was East Florida, what you probably think of as Florida, and this part here is West Florida. And it lost them both. And it's a big part of why the British stopped fighting, because they were afraid that the Spanish were going to target Jamaica next. There were even plans, which always makes me kind of wonder what would have happened. There were plans the Spanish were hatching to invade Nova Scotia if you can imagine like a whole different world, uh, uh, what could have happened in that case. All right, so British America endured also because the loyalists stayed and they reinforced what might have been a sort of small backwater colony of Nova Scotia. They sent 60,000 loyalists throughout the British empire, about half of them to Nova Scotia. And taking seriously their perspective and experiences helps as well to reframe what this war was about and what its aftermath really meant. All right, a third contention. Colonial America also endured. <laughs> it obscures more than it helps to mark 1776 as the end of the American colonial era. Um, it's a real question and I, I, I pose this to my students, when did colonial America stop being colonial? Uh, to this day, Britain retains several territories, or it, 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 sorry, I should say, uh, it did, Britain and Canada didn't sever their last formal political ties until 1982. And to this day, uh, Britain formally retains several territories in the Caribbean, including Bermuda, the Virgin Islands, and Montserrat. And meanwhile, several other nations uh, belong in the British Commonwealth of Nations, a voluntary association of 54 nations. Uh, we just saw the visit of William and Kate to uh, Jamaica and some other Caribbean nations to, to much fanfare. So uh, in that sense, it remains colonial, but also it remains colonial because there's the United States. There are plenty of people who argue that the colonizing project was not halted in 1783, but heightened, amplified, uh, intensified by uh, American independence. The United States has traditionally positioned itself not as a colonizing nation, but of course, that depends on your perspective. So a fourth contention. The American Revolution was a war involving slavery, and so was the peace that followed. This has been, there's been a lot of uh, contention over whether or not the American Revolution was a war over slavery. And I'm not going to jump into that. That's not actually what I'm saying. But I am saying that uh, the, the question of whether or not the slavery would be perpetuated, challenged, or even abolished was not on the table for most people. Enslaved people certainly were thinking in those ways, but not many of the other uh, constituents in these conflicts were thinking in those ways. But slavery nevertheless became central to the conflict. Um, with Dunmore's proclamation in no, uh, November 7th of 1775, he offered freedom to enslaved people who ran away from the, their their rebel masters and would come and join the British forces. He promised them freedom. And the historian Sylvia Frey has argued that this made the war into a triangular conflict. There are at any point in the South, and that's where the majority of the fighting was from 1778 to 1781, it's in the South. And that means there are three major forces potentially of combatants. There are two armies, the British and the Americans. And then there's this third force that at any point could become hostile if it could get access to arms, if it could be mobilized. And both sides thought seriously about doing this. At one point, Congress is telling Washington if that he needs to mobilize slaves or else they're going to lose Charleston and Savannah. And he says, no, and they do, they lose Charleston and Savannah. So uh, both sides knew that there were these potential combatants at all times and they're always concerned about it and thinking about it. So in the wake of the war, both empires would have to reckon with the costs and perils of slavery going forward. This is very central to what they're all thinking about. And so that is why I, I, I teach my students so that it, the war involved slavery from the beginning, through it, and at the end, the aftermath. All right, final contention. 
1783, continental North America, uh, and, and here I'm really specifying everything west of the Ma Appalachian Mountains, shouldn't be understood as US history. <laughs> Not yet, it's still global history. It could have become part of the United States, but also it could have not. It could have done something totally different. It's better understood in this rubric of global history rather than US history. There's no reason to assume that it would become part of the US. Um, another way of, uh, sorry, moving. Um, Sorry, so uh, this is what the map looks like in 1784 and the British uh, let the Americans have the Trans-Appalachian West, the section between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River, probably because they thought the Americans could never actually su successfully take it. Um, and so this is uh, uh, you know, one element, but it, they do this knowing it, it causes inter internal strife amongst the states about which states are going to have control over it. It takes a long time for them to sort out that this will be shared and national territory. And then meanwhile, there are actually uh, uh, separatist groups trying to form their own colonies all over the place in what becomes Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Vermont, Maine, all of these had a chance. Some of them came very close. And so again, it helps students to think about how do we think about these questions of self-determination when these folks over here are trying to claim self-determination and not being allowed to do it? How does it make the map look if some of these would have worked out? What would that have done? So to put it another way, uh, 17, in 1783 and long after, the size and shape of the US was deeply contingent other powers and possible futures remained in play. Uh, All right. To, oh, sorry, I, I just have one last thing to say. Um, so I just wanted to close that, that zooming out to this global vision uh, allows us to think about sort of central questions uh, of what the war was about. And the ones that I'll leave you with are, um, in the end, this is a, the central questions were about self-determination and control over resources especially North American land, labor, and trade. And in the pursuit of self-determination, colonial elites had to open up the political process to others, but in so doing, they, they are, um, and control of resources, but in so doing, they are doing it in ways that um, uh, close it down for others. So those are the, the big questions I wanted to leave you with that, that sort of, to me, help, help function or, or work with these sort of big five global points. And those are my, that's where I will close it. Oh, well, these are the other questions. I, we can come back to this if you want, but I am at time, so I will end. All right. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jessica, for that terrific presentation. Uh, now we'll go on to Adrian. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Give me just a moment. Let's All right, if someone wants to give me a nod, a thumbs up, or some verbal confirmation, you all can see what's up. Yes, you can see it. All you right, see thank it. you. So I want to do a couple of things. First off, let me say thank you on behalf of the entire Museum of the American Revolution for all of the panelists and for all of the guests who have chosen to spend part of your Friday afternoon with us and then so much of your Saturday with us. We understand how much of your time and your life that takes and we are deeply grateful for it. I also want to acknowledge, so I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Museum of the American Revolution, but we're joined here uh, actually by two other members of the education team. And so I just wanna call out Michael Hensinger, who is our Manager of School Programs, as well as Andy Weinman, who is one of our longest serving educators. He's been with us since before the museum opened its doors to the public. So a lot of what I'm saying is actually reflective of so much of the work and continued effort that they put into running school and teacher experiences at our institution. So for anybody who doesn't know who or where we are as an institution, we are a brand new museum. We just opened to the public in April of 2017. And thinking as we all constantly are about recent world history, you all can understand how new we still feel because we have been physically closed for about two of those years that we have existed as a physical institution. So that's been fascinating. Um, our physical location is at 3rd and Chestnut Streets, but you are just 
just as likely to encounter us for educational experiences on the internet at this point, uh, in particular because of COVID. So you can find us at www.amrevmuseum.org. Emma mentioned earlier and yesterday that the me versus we title came from me, but I want to acknowledge how many people have been having conversations about this. And I'll give you one example. So I didn't know exactly what I was going to say in this presentation until to be fair, probably yesterday afternoon. <laughs> but as I was reading about um, just, you know, things in life the other day, I was on the website backpacker.com. You know, it's getting warm, starting to think about going outside and camping and all sorts of things like that. And I clicked open an article about reservations at uh, state and national park sites. And what this article was talking about is how difficult it's been for people to be able to get camp reservations because tons of people are booking campsites at the beginning of the season and then making the decision not to go and not canceling their site meaning that other people who want to go camping at that actual point in time of the reservation aren't able to go camping and these sites sit open because some folks have decided they're not going to use their reservations but never took the steps to free them for other people and the article ends with, we need to switch from a me to a we mindset. We all love nature and we want to get out and do this. Be kind. Please cancel. If you look at canceling as an act of kindness, you could be giving your spot to a kid who's going camping for the first time. And so when we're thinking about me versus we, we're thinking about this orientation of my rights, my wants, my needs, and sometimes not thinking about the needs, the wants, and the rights of the community. We're often not putting ourselves into the shoes of other people and trying to understand the world from their perspective to think about how we can do things that are kinder for them or better serving for the community as a whole. Maybe a slightly different way of thinking about that is that we have, I think, all seen some examples over the past few years of people thinking more about rights than they do about responsibilities. But what is the relationship between rights and responsibilities? And I've been thinking a lot about how much of this emphasis on rights above responsibility towards others is shaped either by founding myths, by overemphasizing certain elements of the revolution, or by underemphasizing other elements of the American Revolution. So I've been thinking about, can we complicate the story of the American Revolution? And frankly, we as an institution have been thinking about that since the beginning, because it's necessary in order to tell an accurate story of what the revolution was as best we can. But also, can we do it in ways that are engaging and that promote positive and pro-social outcomes. And I was thinking about this yesterday uh, from Thomas's presentation and thinking about how do we help create a usable past? How do we help to contribute to something that is meaningful, that people can take action from, that people can feel empowered by? And so for us, we want it to be engaging. We don't want it to be eat your broccoli. We don't want it to be depressing. We want the story that we tell to be one that is open and full and honest and truthful, but that is something that can be used by people to work towards a better future. Okay, so as an institution, we think the answer to whether this can be done is yes. And so what I wanna do is give you a couple of examples of how we do that. So first I'm gonna talk about character cards at the museum. So our core student program is called Through Their Eyes. The longer subtitle is Major Causes and Events of the American Revolution, but really Through Their Eyes. And so what do we do with this? Well, you can see the young people in this image are holding these character cards that have the names of different individuals on them. There are 18 different cards for 18 real people who lived during the revolutionary era. And as we go through the experience of taking the students through the core galleries and having conversations with them around objects, around documents, around ideas, showing them films and all sorts of things like that, we use the character cards as a touch point so that the students are thinking about how their specific individual would have experienced these moments. What are the questions that might, they might have asked? Were they there? What was their perspective? How was their family impacted? And so on and so forth. And you can see some of the questions that we ask students to think about as we go through. So just at a basic level, like starting off, what's your person's name? Where's your person from? 
How old are they when the first shots of the war are fired? What do we know about their family? And then, as I said, they're looking for stories that connect to their person as they explore the galleries with their educator. So let me just give you an example of what some of those uh, people, who some of those people are and what the cards look like. So on one side of the card, we sort of have these um, signs and symbols of the American Revolution that we can engage in conversation with the students around and just get them thinking about representative symbolism and all sorts of things like that. And what are our ideas when it comes to America? And what are our ideas when it comes to uh, the British Empire? What do we think uh, resistance looks like? And so on and so forth. And then here's four examples of the people that we feature on the character cards. We've got uh, Dolly Payne Todd Madison. You can see, okay, so she's born uh, May 20th, 1768, where she is when she's born in North Carolina. Um, a little bit about her family. She's six years old when the first shots of the war are fired. And then a couple of specific details about her family situation or her personal situation over the course of the war. Uh, you can see that we've got a range of different people. We've got Albert Gallatin. We've got Tayona Wayute, who is uh, from the Seneca Nation. We've got Isaac Granger, who's also known as Isaac Jefferson, and he's an interesting one to talk about when we think about Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. And so as the students are hanging out at these different areas, they're thinking about whether or not they want to help tear down the statue of King George III, how they might feel hearing the words of the Declaration of Independence and so on and so forth. Okay, how would your person react to this? Stand in their shoes, look at the world through their perspective. Of the of the experience, spoiler alert, if you haven't been to the museum before, there is a wall of photographs of people who lived during the revolutionary era. And each of the 18 character cards that we developed were based on a person whose photograph we actually were able to display on that wall. So the students who have probably only ever seen representations of the revolutionary era through like watercolor paintings or statues or like oil uh, paintings and things like that, they get to see a photo of these people, which makes them real. It helps them to understand that they were as solid flesh and bone as we are in the world today. And so we have the students find their person on the wall and then try to ask them to reflect on, okay, what do you think your person's life was like in the late 1830s, the 1840s, 50s, 60s, when their photo was taken? What did the revolution mean to them? How do you think that the ideals of the revolution had impacted their lives at this point in time? And then we'll also, we'll often bring that forward to the present. Do you think that we've lived up to the ideals of the American Revolution? We don't provide any answers as educators. That is for the students to be sharing their thoughts on. And we can, you know, poke and prod and ask all sorts of things, but we don't provide any opinions on that. And then if you think that we have, okay, what is your responsibility in maintaining that? And if you don't think that we have, okay, what are some steps that you think that we can take in order to get there? So that your photograph, when someone looks at that later on, they can think about where you were standing in relation to the American Revolution, your perspective on the ongoing revolution, and maybe say that by the time your photo was taken, that we had gotten there, wherever we feel that the there needs to be. So why do we do this with the character cards? And I should know, we're not the only institution that does something like this. You all have probably seen like the Titanic exhibit does this, the World War II Museum does it with dog tags, uh, the Holocaust Museum in DC does something very similar. And there's a pedagogical reason, right, that folks do this. Um, for us at a base level, it's recognize the diversity of the revolutionary era. We want students to recognize the types of diversity that exists in the revolutionary era, that there's so many different perspectives from which people can be understanding what's taking place at those moments in time. We want them to engage in perspective taking and see that there are different perspectives. And perspective taking is one of the foundational uh, contributing factors to experiencing and flexing um, empathy or your empathetic muscles. And that's the thing that we're really trying to accomplish as an institution is to have people to, to use their sense of empathy to try to understand the world from other people's perspectives. Okay, so another way that we do this 
through historical simulations. We started these in partnership with another organization here in Philadelphia called the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And we've mostly focused on one called Debating Independence, where students take on the role of people who attended the Continental Congress, and they have to figure out whether or not they are going to vote for independence. So each student represents a specific person from the Continental Congress. They get some information about their person prior to coming to the historical simulation. We ask them to do some additional research. And then what they do is they engage in both small and large group conversations about what are the pros and cons of this? And what does this mean from my person's perspective? What does it mean from the colony that they're in? And so on and so forth. Now, one of the things we like about this is because it helps to remove some of the inevitability of the story of the American Revolution, though if any of you have worked with students and have tried to get them to do that, to remove that sense of, well, everyone knew what was going to happen, it is very difficult to accomplish that, but we take steps towards it. Really, though, what's most important to us are two other things. So one of them is that it helps to unflatten the signers from sort of composite privileged white male into actual individuals from different places with different life experiences with different concerns and so on and so forth and our favorite part i think i'm speaking for andy for michael and for the other folks who've helped to run these is that as the students are debating we go around to the different tables and the delegations and we start to add new information and we start to just like prod and poke and do little things to get them question or think more broadly or think more deeply about whatever it is that they were saying. And we try to insert the voices of the people who were not present or not heard in the different rooms where the debates were taking place. Which communities were represented, which communities weren't? How do we define who our community is? As we think about some of the challenges that people are facing, both in the revolutionary era and in the present day. And I wanna actually connect that to one of our digital interactives called Season of Independence. This is a screenshot from it. Uh, this is based on the work of Pauline Mayer, um, who writes a book uh, called, ooh, can I remember, American Scripture. Um, it's all about the writing, the creation of the Declaration of Independence. And she notes, eight different declarations and sort of similar documents from all around the 13 colonies that come before the, uh, the July 4th version of the declaration that we tend to think about today. And so this interactive that lives both in our galleries as well as on our website, what it does is it's a timeline and a map. And so each of the blue dots that you see here on the screen, and there's many more because you're not seeing the entirety of the map, but each of those represents one of the different declarations or votes or statements or things like that that express support for declaration. Um, and then we also have supplemented it with images and quotes from a variety of different kinds of people, from different places, different nationalities, different races and ethnicities, different religious backgrounds, different stations in life, different statuses of freedom or unfreedom, uh, different genders, and so on and so forth, to show people that there were multiple perspectives on independence and that not everybody was excited for it and that there were many different reasons to be either excited or unexcited for independence. So again, it's about perspective taking, it's about hearing different voices, it's starting to think about the different communities that exist and how people are imagining community. We'll also just lift up maybe two other things. So one of them is we have another interactive that lives both in our galleries as well as on our website called Finding Freedom. This one is located in our galleries in the area that focuses on the war in the South. And specifically, this area focuses, this corner where Finding Freedom is, focuses on um, Virginia in 1781 and leading up to the siege and the Battle of Yorktown. And what we did was we created this interactive to dig into the stories of people of African descent who are living in Virginia in 1781, as this is about to happen, taking place, and then what happens afterwards. And so for the average person, if you say African-American, Virginia, 1781, people have built a picture in their heads of what this person's life was like. And they flatten every person of African descent's experiences into that one picture. So we said, we're gonna choose five people who have very different stories. And we're gonna show those stories to people so that you can stand in a first person perspective, look out through their eyes and understand what are the 
questions they were asking about their lives? What are the challenges they're facing in their lives? What are the decisions they have to make? What are the opportunities for agency that they might have in their own lives? What are the repercussions of the decisions that they make? And so on and so forth. So that all of a sudden, that flattening of African-American person in Virginia in 1781 becomes multi-layered and becomes textured. We also provide other opportunities for sort of reflection through another person's story. And so we have a number of first person theatrical performances that we offer both on site at the mu museum as well as virtually. So on this screen, you can see upper left-hand corner, we've got Elizabeth Freeman. Many of you are probably familiar with her story. Short version, sues for her freedom in Massachusetts and wins. Uh, upper right hand corner, there is a Rebecca Van Dyke, who right now exists just as a recording on our website. All of these are freely accessed on our website if they're up there. She is uh, a woman who has um, revolutionary leanings, who's married to a man who is loyalist, and she's living in New Jersey. Um, she has her family property confiscated by the revolutionaries. Her husband is um, arrested and exiled for some point in time, uh, and she has this interesting opportunity to figure out what it means to be a woman and a woman who supported the revolution, but whose family has been torn apart by it, as she thinks about whether or not she's going to vote in New Jersey during the approximately 30 year time frame that women and free people of African descent have the ability to vote in New Jersey. So she's digging into some really interesting stories. Uh, in the lower right hand corner, we've got Joseph Plum Martin. So sort of sharing an experience of um, a soldier who joins the Continental Army as a teenager and who rises in rank and has all sorts of interesting life experiences and ex reflecting on his life as a soldier. Uh, in the center, we've got a young James Fortin. Again, many people are probably familiar with his story, uh, serves on a privateer ship, has some great experiences, has some challenging experiences, becomes a leading figure in Philadelphia, um, African-American or otherwise, and uses his influence to support um, um, the abolitionist cause. And then uh, on the left-hand side, Richard St. George, uh, who is a, an Irish slash British soldier who fights to put down two different revolutions, one in what's going to become the United States and one in Ireland. So lots of different perspectives. We're asking students to and whoever else pays attention to these to not just automatically think, okay, binary, black versus white, heroes, villains, revolutionaries are good, and the British and British supporters are evil. It was so much more complicated than that. And there were so many different gray areas. And that's what we're trying to lift up. Our, our contention is that if we can help people to do that in the revolutionary era, we're providing a better footing for them to do that in the present day. So I just wanted to say there's a couple of things that are helping us to understand that we might be on the right path. And maybe this provides some support for teachers to think about how they can use these sorts of things in their classrooms. So this is a um, some research from the Wilkin and Consulting Group. Specifically, it's from research they've been doing into curiosity, empathy, and social justice. And so I just wanted to lift up the fact that through their research, what they know is that unimonic curiosity, which is basically when people go down research rabbit holes and go from one thing to another to another, that kind of curiosity expands worldviews. It promotes greater cultural understanding. It empowers more compassionate perspective taking, and it allows people to have more comfort with conflicting truths. Those like two things can exist in your head, as Ish was saying yesterday, right? They can both be true at the same time and you can hold them. And then how do museums help to support that eudaimonic curiosity? Well, it's all about the exposure, right? If you show people all of these different perspectives, you're opening up their world to start taking into account what it means that those different perspectives exist. Through that, horizons are broadened, minds are opened, and new perspectives are taken on. Now, we've been engaged in a long-term school impact study. When I say we've been engaged, we started it directly before COVID. We've done one year and then paused it, and we hope to pick back up. But from the first year of that school impact study, a couple of things that we've heard from teachers that their students are gaining and demonstrating. An ability to see from the perspectives of others and understand what shaped those perspectives. They're gaining historical thinking strategies through the examination and the making of inferences about both documents and artifacts. And they're developing an ability to make connections between the American Revolution and today. 
and just a couple of quotes from teachers, it deepens their interest in the shaping of our country and students are more respectful of others and other viewpoints. This is exactly what we wanna see. This is what we wanna encourage. And we wanna see ourselves as an institution do even better at promoting that. So I'm more than happy to chat with people further via email and I'm really excited for the Q&A and I will invite both Michael and Andy when there are questions about what we're doing if you all wanna also share your perspectives. Oh, so thank you. Well, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Adrian, for that terrific, terrific presentation for all the great things you're doing, you and your uh, your colleagues at the museum. Um, maybe I could start off with a question that tries to connect some of the themes here. Look, um, I wouldn't be here uh, in any way, and I wouldn't be a historian if I didn't agree with the kind of goals that Adrian enunciated at the end, um, especially the appreciation for conflicting truths. Um, which we saw, I thought, brilliantly described and laid out in, in uh, Jessica's presentation. Um, uh, and yet, um, at the same time, I think Jessica's anecdote about uh, the gentleman at dinner and George Washington suggests a set of very real constraints on that approach, especially, I would argue, with respect to the American Revolution, because it's been such a focus of what the professors call filiopietism right? That is the worship of our ancestors. And it's so integral to American identity. I'm just curious to hear more, each of you talk more about this resistance and especially how you respond. I thought Jessica's response to the GW guy was fantastic, but um, I also wonder how you respond to a, a related but different kind of objection, which would say, okay, the, the Adrians and the Jessicas and the, and the Johns of the world, they want to promote conflicting truths. But nations have to promote one truth. Nations have to promote nationhood. And the American Revolution has been at the heart of that. And the more conflict that you introduce, the more difficult it will be, especially at a rather polarized time in the current history of the United States, to actually be a nation and act like one. Uh, please understand, this is not my point of view, right? But because I live in the public sphere, I hear it and I'm aware of it. And so I'm just curious, in light of what both of you have laid out, how you respond to that. Jessica, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think what I would say, that's a great question. And I, I think the reason that I responded to Batman the way I did is I didn't want him to feel like I was attacking him or disagreeing with him because I felt like the moment I did, it would just make him, you know, hostile. He was very nice, but, you know. Um, and for me, I feel like zooming out actually gives perspective. And so it, 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 it allows for a larger sort of set of questions. But your larger point about like, don't we need some kind of core story for a nation? I agree. And and one of the slide, the slide at the end, I'm going to go ahead and, and and share it now really quickly. The slide at the end that I, I zoomed past, um, these are the questions that I think that a global perspective can really help us to ask. Like, what is the size of the political community? That is a really important question in the American Revolution. Who is in it and who is not? Who gets a voice? Who doesn't? What constitutes equitable access? And then how do we ensure it? These are questions they were asking then. These are questions we're still asking now. And what I, I completely agree with Adrian about the, this, this question about rights versus duties, rights and responsibilities, individual freedoms, the greater good. And I think what I'd say is that, you know, if there is a story, a single story, around which nationhood coheres, it's around these sets of questions and it's around the way that we continue to try to answer them. And we never have and we never will probably. These are really hard questions and what works in one era maybe doesn't in another. And it's, it's always gonna be in conversation. But um, I, I think that this is, um, but I think that this, that, like, that's what I would argue, that, that that's what the nation is. It's not necessarily a core set of, uh, one history, it's a, it's a core set of ideals and questions that we struggle around. And that, that the more we can kind of have tools to think about those questions together, the more that helps us. But, mm -hmm. but a, big, a big vision can really help. Like, like zooming out, thinking with the most perspective possible, I think it helps it feel less like, well, that was a, a horrible thing. Like, well, bring it up here. Maybe it was a big crime, but like, let's think about it on a very large level of sort of how the world was operating writ large, 
anyway, that that's that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that I think that's a great answer, Adrian. Yeah, I think that a lot of the the anger and the frustration that we feel from some or that we hear from some people who are concerned about like the decentering, for example, of like founding fathers from the story and things like that it's rooted in fear, right? It's rooted in the sense that they are losing something, that we are forgetting something as a nation, that their world is being changed. Um, or it's rooted in the sense that, um, that they feel like they were tricked, right? When they learned a specific version of history. So often we hear from people, how did I not know that when I was growing up? How come nobody taught me these stories? But imagine if we do teach people these stories from the beginning, right? What is, what is the outcome of that? If there are fewer people who are surprised by things when they become adults and decision makers in their communities and in the nation. So that's a piece of what I would say. That's like, that's the value of teachers. That's the value of education is that we can do something to actually prevent entire generations of people from feeling like they were hoodwinked or like they're being attacked because they actually have a broader story to begin with. I also would just, you know, turn back to that research from the Wilkening Group and from our own impact study, learning about the diversity of opinions and perspectives and peoples in the revolutionary era does not have to engender anger. Mm -hmm. You know, it does not have to engender uh, disunity. And just because the story that we share of the American Revolution or about the American nation um, no longer necessarily is one of sort of a continuing pathway of progress doesn't mean that we have to lose some sort of central narrative of who we are ideologically as a nation. If we think of a nation as both a political and geographic uh, unit, um, as well as a, an assemblage of peoples, then there's still a way that we can think about like an ongoing quest for freedom and equality, where different people's stories and voices are rising and lowering at different points in time, but are all creating a tapestry that moves the sort of larger body, the geopolitical ideological understanding of the nation towards something that we're reaching for. Not everybody is reaching for it at the same time. People are fighting actively against it at various points in time. But like we at the, Amer the Museum of the American Revolution talk about an ongoing revolution that we are part of an experiment. We are still a baby nation, you know, like thinking about the age of nations around this planet, we are a, an infant nation. So to think that we should have some expectation that we have arrived versus that we are in the, the progress and process of creating, I think would be a mistake. So it's all just being worked on. I couldn't agree more. I'm curious, since you use, though, the term central narrative, would you still describe it as a progressive one, even though it might not be progressive in the sense that some earlier people use that term, insofar as we're moving closer to fulfilling those ideals? Or is that not a fair description of your understanding of the central narrative? I think it depends on how granular you want to go. And I think it depends on sort of which lens you're looking. So we could look at um, federal laws, for example, and we could say, well, we moved from the revolutionary era to the reconstruction amendments, and that is beautiful. And then we moved to like civil rights acts and things like that. And that has been beautiful. And we've legalized gay marriage and that is beautiful. So there's like sort of that umbrella version. And then we have to think about like states and communities and like we can go, we can keep narrowing that focus down. So I think it's it's challenging to make a blanket statement, but I think that we can talk about a pursuit. Right, I agree it's challenging and I've opposed any single narrative. I mean, you know, to me, I'll just put my cards on the table. I mean, I, I have a 20th anniversary book uh, edition of my Culture Wars book coming out. And I'm quite troubled at the idea that we should have a single narrative. Um, uh, and yet at the same time, I'll confess that I have one too. And my narrative is there isn't a single one. And my narrative, what I love about America, is everyone narrates it on their own. Um, you can't celebrate us as a land of freedom and then tell every individual what to think. Uh -huh. That just doesn't make sense to me. But I've got my own narrative too, which is I'm deeply opposed to imposing one narrative because I think what's great about America is you get to tell the story on your own. 
Um, but, of, but of course, you know, that re-asks a whole bunch of questions, right? What if everyone's telling a different story, right? Um, you can't really have a nation on those terms. Uh, so I, I, take that, I take that challenge seriously. Well, I think I think one of the problems that we're struggling with right now, and this is where the museum is so important and the work of educators, is sure, you can all have your own story, but it would be much better, in my opinion, if it were rooted in some facts, if it were rooted in reality. And and if and, and facts are I mean, historians yeah. will tell you facts are slippery things and there's perspective, as we've just been dis discussing at great length, that I could read a document and you could read a document and different things might occur to us out of that document or, or strike us or, or we might, you know, and, and, or we might think this, this person's evidence is better than that person's evidence. I think they're more persuasive for whatever reason. So, but I think that the pro, one of the problems I think we're focused, like that, that we're struggling with at the moment is not that people can't come up with their own narratives. I, I, I agree with you. There are people who are saying there's only one and anyone else is unpatriotic, but, um, but the real problem for me is also that it needs to be based in real research and some sort of evidence. And I think that's, the, not, that's not what I say. Not all stories are created equal. Well, this, yeah. is, this is why I always say, you know, I was just at a, an event for uh, incoming students who might want to be history majors and why should you be a history major? And I was saying, you know, what a liberal arts education, and I think history in particular, gives you is the about, ability to do research, evaluate evidence, and you know, critique it and and be able to communicate about it. Like that's what that's what ideally what a liberal arts education should give you. And then you could take that into anything. You can take that into business, science, what doesn't matter. Um, I don't need to sell you on becoming a history major, but I, I think that those skills are the most important thing. So I don't need my students to know the dates of the revolution. I wish they would, but what I need them to be able to do is to read a document and say, well, this was written by a slaveholder. So the way that he's describing this circumstance, I should take with a grain of salt, you know, that they can think through who wrote it, what is their audience, what's their purpose, and how might I sort of test what they're saying? What are some other things I might read? Yeah. Um, if they can do that, then like, Yes. Yes. You are yeah, literally yeah. describing historical thinking strategies. That is something that teachers actively try to convey to their students and help them build in their classrooms. And it's something that we try to support the teachers in at the museum. So if you've been through, you'll see that we often have displays that are basically like, how do we know what we know about this? Yeah. Or like, let's break down this image and like lift up things that we're noticing. And like, what was our source from this? We pull back the curtain as often as we can through our exhibits, through our resources, through the conversation that we have because you're absolutely right like people don't have trouble coming up with their own narratives often it's like right. what are they basing that narrative and in? they're not then they're not all created equal i mean if they were i'd just have to hang it up and go to law school right <laughs> i mean you know there, there 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 must be some reason that one narrative would be stronger in some way than another mm -hmm. um uh anyway we're past time i want to thank both of our presenters for just a, a, a fantastic set of short talks um, uh, and for all the all the good works they're doing on behalf of our students, um, we'll take a we'll take a ten minute break, and then we'll reconvene for our roundtable. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was awesome. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Zimmerman. I teach history at the University of Pennsylvania, and we're continuing our discussion uh, on the, uh, the very rich uh, theme of me versus we in the American Revolution. Um, we're going to have now a roundtable uh, with four really interesting speakers who I'm just going to very briefly introduce and then ask them to share some thoughts, some brief thoughts uh, for getting a conversation going. First, we'll hear from uh, Jim Mambuski. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correct. Uh, he leads the Center for Digital History at the Washington Library at George Washington's Mount Vernon. 
Next, we'll hear from Abigail Henry, who is a high school African-American history teacher at Mastery Charter Schools here in Philadelphia. We'll then hear from Alexander Montgomery, who's a digital history postdoctoral fellow at George Washington's Mount Vernon and a recent Penn History PhD grad. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Kerry Sautner, who is the chief learning officer at the National Constitution Center. Um, uh, I've been asked to remind the speakers that uh, um, we're asking just for uh, five minutes, um, uh, which I know is an unfairly brief amount of time, but we really do want to hold to that so we can uh, really have a discussion. So if it's okay, let's start with, with, uh, with Jim. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you all very much uh, for the chance to be here today and uh, the opportunity to uh, follow uh, uh, Jess and Adrian. I don't know how we're going to, you know, actually follow them because that was a very inspiring uh, set of conversations. But um, we're going to do our best. Um, I am very fortunate to be here to represent uh, part of the team that developed the podcast series, Intertwined: The Enslaved Community at George Washington's Mount Vernon, which speaks in many ways to to a lot of the themes we've been talking about today. And I just want to give a brief overview as a way a window into uh, the later discussion we're about to have, uh, an overview of this show, but. Intertwined uh, tells the story of the roughly 577 people enslaved by George and Martha Washington at Mount Vernon over the course of their lives and after by their descendants. And it's an eight part series that explores uh, the enslaved community uh, as a community, as individuals and the Washingtons. And we take that story from the 17th century in the founding moments of slavery in North America through the 21st century in the ways in which we actually interpret or try to interpret slavery at Mount Vernon today. Uh, and if you're so interested, there's a QR code, you can very quickly scan that uh, and it'll pull up our website for, for your uh, personal enjoyment or find us in the podcast feed. Uh, but we can come back to that in a second. The idea actually for this podcast was inspired by a long running exhibit at Mount Vernon called Lives Bound Together Slavery at George Washington's Mount Vernon. That was uh, installed from roughly 2016 through November of last year and uh, was lead curated by my colleague, Jesse McLeod. Uh, and when, uh, when that uh, conversations about uh, the, the deinstallation of this exhibit began to take place, there was a basic idea of, can we extend the life of this exhibit through podcast form? Uh, and this was a major event uh, for Mount Vernon. It's one of the sort of uh, turning points in the institution's interpretation of slavery and the enslaved community at Mount Vernon. So there was very much a desire to use that's its legacy as a means to continue educating. And so the idea for this podcast was born uh, and it came to me and my colleague, Jeanette Patrick in the Center for Digital History at the Washington Library. But we decided very quickly, we simply didn't want to replicate this excellent exhibit uh, as wonderful as it is, but build off of it and build off of it in really some concrete ways so that we could write a narrative story of this history uh, that also has an argument, because uh, all historians want to make good arguments, but one that also leveraged, right, the latest scholarship that had come out since the installation of this exhibit. Uh, in the last couple of years, for example, Mary Thompson has published The Only, the Only Unavoidable Subject of Regret, George Washington Slavery and the, the Enslaved Community at Mount Vernon, probably the definitive book thus far on the enslaved community at Mount Vernon. And then much more recently, Bruce Ragsdale's Washington at the Plow, The Founding Farmer and the Question of Slavery, looking at how Washington's uh, pursuit of agricultural improvement at Mount Vernon began to erode his understanding of himself as an enslaver and the viability of slavery as an economic uh, form of labor for his agricultural ambitions. Uh, and so we wanted to move the story forward using uh, those latest texts we also wanted to demonstrate how historians work, uh, demonstrate the historian's craft so that teachers and students can think along with us about uh, what we know, how we use evidence, and more importantly, what we don't know and why we don't know it, uh, and demonstrate an awareness of historians' disagreements over certain topics. And so as we've been talking this morning, you know, there is no central narrative. It's a, a, the, the, the stories we tell are a product of conversations we have each other, with each other about the past. And if we can demonstrate how that works, uh, it you know build, goes a long way to build more trust in the, the evidence and the arguments that we're presenting to our audience. Um, 
But uh, we, as you might suspect, though, we also wanted to write a story or a, a podcast that was for podcast audiences. Podcast audiences are very different than museum audiences. Uh, if you're a typical museum, perhaps like Mount Vernon, and our focus is on eighth graders, uh, very digestible material that, that uh, young people can internalize uh, and take away something that they can later talk about with their friends or families if they're not simply interested in buying um, stuff at the gift shop, uh, hopefully. But podcast audiences are very different. Uh, podcast audiences are more like an NPR crowd. They're likely to have an, some kind of advanced degree. They want complexity develop, delivered in a compelling yet not overly wrought way. And they want programs around 45 minutes, uh, which is a much longer attention span than an eighth grader is typically, typically going to have. Uh, but we also knew, because we are an educational institution, we had to make something that was going to be uh, usable for um, you know, colleges, universities, uh, and more importantly, you know, secondary schools on down into middle schools. So we, we adopted a number of principles to actually execute this project. Um, and the first is that we actually took Lives Bound Together's thematic structure, uh, but we, we took that structure focused on labor, resistance, uh, the slave trade and whatnot, but we imposed a more, uh, we, we emphasized a, a much more of a chronological structure so that we could show change over time. And that was in part because of the innovations made in recent works by Mary Thompson and Bruce Ragsdale to show how the process of the enslaved community evolved at Mount Vernon. We wanted to show the contingent moments that shaped the choices that people made uh, in this history. We, we decided to frame each episode around the life of a particular individual and, the, and their experiences so that we could uh, unpack the story that we were telling and unpack the arguments that we were making. So in the eight main episodes, you'll learn about Sambo Anderson, uh, Davy Gray, William Lee, Kate, uh, Ona Judge, Edmund Parker, Nancy Carter Quander, and ultimately Caroline Branham and the Washingtons themselves so that you can learn more about the ways in which uh, they shaped or were shaped by this history. And perhaps one of the key things, we were really fortunate to have Brenda Parker serve as our narrator. She's known to some of you on this call today. Uh, she is a historian herself and also a, a historic character interpreter. So she brought a wealth of knowledge of both research and practical experience about the enslaved community to that role. And uh, her, her work is all over the scripts. We actually ended up you know, rewriting several scripts based on feedback that she gave us. Um, so uh, all told then, oh, sorry, that was weird. All told then, uh, we, uh, we produced eight main episodes uh, along, uh, as I said, each uh, centered around a particular individual, takes us from the 17th century through the 21st century. We've got some bonus episodes to date, in part because we had 26 expert contributors to this project, including members of the Descendants community. So we're releasing extended interviews with some of those participants so that you get more bang for your buck and hopefully uh, a, a new source of knowledge is that you can either use for yourself or in the classroom. And speaking of classroom, we have transcripts and teacher resources that are available for your use, uh, including complete reading lists as well. Uh, and uh, links to primary sources. And uh, you can see that the production credits there. But uh, what, I, what I was excited about when I was asked to do this is, is that the series, as I said, does speak to a lot of the themes that we've been talking about today. I mean, we explore stories in the series that speak directly to this idea of me versus we, particularly in the revolutionary period of the, the choices that individuals like Washington or enslaved people like William Lee are making that, uh, that have reverberations uh, for not only the community itself, but the larger history of slavery in North America in the 18th century. And this is true of all of the episodes, I think, uh, but it's particularly true of episodes three and five in which we tackle in whole or part the revolution itself uh, and particularly look at the tension between slavery and freedom and liberty. As some Americans, right, like George Washington are enslaving people uh, like William Lee while they're waging a war for independence. Uh, and some enslaved people like Harry Washington are escaping to British lines and uh, rallying to the King's standard and eventually become part of that loyalist diaspora we heard a little bit about earlier today. So uh, I'll stop there. I hope you give it a listen. I'm excited to talk more about this, this whole theme as we move forward. Um, and uh, again, georgewashingtonpodcast.com uh, 
And thanks for listening. And uh, thanks for listening again, if you are so inclined. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. I'm embarrassed I haven't listened to this yet, but now I'm absolutely going to. Um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll now go on to, to Abigail from Mastery Charter Schools. Hey, everybody. Uh, first, I just wanna say I'm incredibly humbled to be part of this. Um, I have been teaching African-American history at Master Shoemaker for the past 10 years. And before I just, before I give you a brief overview of my revolutionary era unit, I just wanna state two things. First, you should know my students are 99.9% .9 black and any discussion of slavery I have with them, I always say the last thing I wanna do is re-traumatize you. That's a frequent conversation in my room given the violence they're experiencing in their community. My students are 13, 14, and 15, and they have no background knowledge on US history in terms of the class before. So one of my common struggles is I wanna teach black history to students that don't know the three branches of government. Um, prior to my unit on the revolutionary era, I just wanna point out that students have done a unit on the Atlantic Slave War. They've done a unit on the 1619 project. I won a Pulitzer grant. I was part of the uh, initial inaugural co cohort to incorporate the book. And by the, by the time we get to this unit, they have a basic introduction to historical thinking skills. For the revolutionary era unit, it's about approximately a two week unit in my classroom. Lesson one starts with the founding fathers. We don't talk about all of them. I narrow it down to just four and students have to figure out um, each founding father's relationship with slavery. That's followed by a lesson on the Declaration of Independence and then the wonderful Frederick Douglass speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July. Then we do a lesson on Crispus Attucks. Um, I, on the whiteboard, I project these two images. I have students go up and they circle the similarities in red, they circle the differences in blue. And it's amazing that in most classes, they do not catch uh, Crispus Attucks on the right until like the very end of that activity. Uh, they then read his biography and learn about his contribution. Um, so lesson five, we then talk about Hercules and Una Judge. Um, by this point, George Washington seems to be a really big theme today, but I've had this memory of a student this year who said to me, she, she was like, Miss Henry, is George Washington a bad guy or a good guy? Because I just keep hearing like these mixed things. And I was like, hmm, I'm not sure. Let's pose that to the class. And that led to a wonderful discussion um, about Washington after those two lessons. After kind of the focus on the founding fathers and their relationship with slavery, um, a big focus in my room throughout the school year is just black resistance and black liberation. So we do a deep dive into Bacon's rebellion, looking at how that codified slave law in Virginia. Um, we then do a discuss, this is my first time, I feel like this year I finally taught the Haitian revolution uh, effectively to teenagers. We spe specifically look at primary sources that the founding fathers wrote about the Haitian revolution. They read a letter from that's, Governor Mifflin sends uh, about his fear that Haitian refugees might show up uh, in the city. And this focus on resistance, Black resistance, is a really great follow-up to a lesson I do from Leslie Alexander and Michelle Alexander's essay on fear in the 1619 Project book. Um, students talk a lot about this kind of relationship between Black, when Black people fight back, what sort of fear it causes and what backlash. Uh, they were able to make comparisons between the Haitian Revolution and Amy Cooper in Central Park calling uh, the cops on a black bird watcher. Um, that student writing on that is also published on the Pulitzer Center's website if you are interested. Um, finally, after diving deep into those acts of resistance, the performance task, the summative assessment for the unit is a Nat Turner mock trial. Mock trials in my classroom are 
a rite of passage. Um, students who come back always say, have you done the Nat Turner trial yet? Have you done the Lincoln trial? Those were so much fun. They use secondary and primary sources um, to argue whether or not Nat Turner should be found guilty. Um, there are witness statements, there are lawyers. Um, it is a whole lot of fun. That trial itself um, takes about five days because it's the first trial um, in my classroom. After that, um, on a Saturday, I bring students in to watch the Birth of a Nation movie. Uh, that is something that I do every year. Of course, obviously I have to get um, permission from their parents since it is rated R. The last thing I just wanted to share, um, only because I was on the earlier session, is this past week, I took students to see uh, the Caddo and Harriet Tubman statues. And one of the best takeaways of just this trip was it led to a really good discussion about courage and fear and how Black people throughout history, especially like Black activists, probably held at the same time, you know, brave, brave courage to run away and help and assist other people. But at the same time, always having a sense of fear of like, you could lose your life like Cato did at any single moment. And because of that field trip, I realized next year when I teach the revolutionary era again, I want that to be more of a conversation in terms of black people having that dual feeling at the same time. Um, I think that is about it. Well, thank, thank you, Abigail, for that, that terrific presentation on that last point. I once a student of mine said, you know, you can't be courageous unless you're afraid. Yes. Um, right, it wouldn't have meaning. Um, uh, thank you for those great comments for what, for what you're doing for all of your students. Um, now we're going to go on to Alexandra Montgomery. Hello, everyone. Give me just one minute to get a little bit situated to hear. I do not have slides today, which is rare for me. Um, I also just want to say up top, I was in a bike accident uh, last weekend, uh, which has impacted my ability, first of all, to take the kind of furious notes on this fantastic session that I would like to be taking, um, but also has made me a little bit more uh, discombobulated than usual. So my apologies if, or if I'm slightly disheveled or um, rambly, but I will, I will do my best here. Um, so just a little bit very briefly about myself, although it was mostly covered in the introduction, um, I am a 2010 uh, Penn Early American History PhD. Um, I am a longtime friend and fan of the McNeil Center, so it's really fun to be back in this type of a context. Uh, right now, my current position is I, have a, I am a postdoctoral fellow um, at primarily at um, the Fred Smith National Library at Mount Vernon, along with Jim, who is, who I, is technically my boss. Hi, Jim. Please give me good reviews on my performance review. Um, and what I am primarily tasked with is uh, being the project manager for a new initiative that Mount Vernon is putting together along with the Leventhal Map and Education Center up at the Boston Public Library in Boston, uh, which is called Argo, Early, uh, Revolu sorry, American Revolutionary Geographies Online. Um, and what Argo is and is going to be, um, or is going to be because it is currently in the process of becoming, is a standalone web portal uh, that collates really digitized maps of North America broadly understood, so from small scales to big scales, um, in one spot, uh, maps of North America made between about 1750 uh, and 1800. So it's this narrow 50 year window, but within that 50 year window, trying to be uh, as broad as possible and have as much coverage as possible. So this is both manuscript maps and published maps. Uh, and this is a, a deeply collaborative project. So maps from the collections of Mount Vernon, as well as the Leventhal Center are obviously going to be included, but this is a project that is co collaborating with a number of large institutions. So currently we have 21 partners um, including the Clements Library, um, we have some maps, Library of Congress. So all we're trying to get is of all of the big map, relevant map collections here. Um, and these are maps that have already been digitized. Uh, so we're not actually digitizing any fresh maps, but what it's going to be is a centralized spot to access these specific maps and also to give people um, the tools and the context that they need to really understand these maps. So we're going to be commissioning and including a lot of essays about specific maps, as well as themes. You'll be able to browse by particular themes. So for example, if you'd like to pull up all of the maps we have that depict indigenous um, villages, that's a, a sort of pet project of mine, you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to browse maps that have some relevance to African-American history um, and just make it as curated as possible and really give folks 
as many tools as they can to work with these documents. So in essence, it's a, a large digital primary sources um, and documents kind of a project. Um, so that's what Argo is. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the relevance of Argo to some of the big themes here. And I sort of have two different uh, takes, I guess, on the me versus we theme uh, when it comes to Argo. Um, the first is just that maps themselves are a really fantastic document for trying to pick apart this tension, just because, um, on the, for, well, first of all, they're visual, and I find uh, engaging folks through visual means has always been um, easier. This is this is my experience as a classroom teacher that that it, trying to bring kids in to a comp to a complex conversation the easiest and most foolproof although nothing obviously in the classroom is ever foolproof as I'm sure pretty much everyone here knows um, was to start with a visual image and maps are just great for that but also because maps almost never have one author maps are almost because of their nature they are almost always collaborative even if they are made by one person, which is certainly not always the case. Uh, they're often incorporating knowledge from a lot of other people in ways that are visible and invisible. Um, they often pass through multiple hands. So you'll see maps that are like you know, hobbled together, hodgepodges of lots of other smaller maps, which is the case with almost every large map of North America. In fact, every large map of North America from this era is of necessity, uh, you know, a putting together of lots of other smaller maps. So there's lots of authors. Uh, and there's also always a, a very, um, easy to communicate process of what do you include and what do you exclude, right? So this is a very, very basic concept uh, in teaching historical thinking skills, right? Um, you have to include some things and exclude some things. Uh, with maps, you have to, because it is, it is physically impossible to make a map that has every single piece of information about a place. It is simply impossible. Um, and within that, why are people making the choices that they're making? Why are some things shown? Why are some things not shown? So I guess my first thing to just throw in there is that maps themselves are a really fantastic uh, resource, um, both in terms of um, trying to bring these conversations to publics that are not always um, ready to or interested in having these conversations. They're a really good jumping off point. And I hope that Argo will provide uh, more fodder for that. The second thing um, is just to say, so that's my only like real um, insight in terms of the actual time period. Because uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is I'm very, very early um, in my personal journey of, uh, you know, moving out from graduate school and into a more public engagement type of position and type of role. Um, so I was kind of thinking about, you know, what can I possibly contribute? Um, we've got all these other fantastic people who have spoken yesterday and today and mere minutes ago um, that I have felt so privileged and excited to listen to. Um, and in comparison to that, you know, I've only been doing this since June and the website hasn't launched yet. So I don't really have any particularly deep or profound things to say about how we can tell these stories to a public. But what I can say and what I have has been really important for me as someone with a very traditional grad school background, moving into a more um, public humanities type of role is the me versus we importance in doing the actual work of communicating these things, right? Um, you the 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 process of um bringing the stories of the american revolution to publics is inherently a we project you cannot do it uh which, which is a bit of a a mind bender i think um uh, coming out of a strictly academic background and i know there's going to be a lot of people on this call who are like whatever we get this but for me you know um you get trained to come up with your own interpretation of a thing the goal is to produce a book um, and now I am working in a context where I am working with closely with a lot of people with lots of different uh, backgrounds, lots of different sets of deep expertise. And that is absolutely essential to trying to communicate this thing. You know, working with um, people with libraries backgrounds, archives backgrounds, with donors who might just be really interested and excited about history, but who are not themselves historians. Um, and that collaborative we process is absolutely crucial um, in the context of this big upcoming banner 250 thing in order to get the kinds of stories we want across. It has to be collaborated. It has to be a we. So I just kind of wanted to bring that up, flag it, put a pin in it, um, that that is something that I've, I've been wrestling with. In addition to the sort of thematics of the era of how do we tell this me versus we story? How do we as academics or how do we as folks who are coming out of a particular specialty or set of specialties, how do we build that we? How do we build that community? Um, so to that end, I'm very excited about the additional things that will come out uh, Emma and Lynn from from this, uh, this this great thing that you're all are working on. Um, and that is that is really all I have uh, to say about that topic. And I'm very excited for further discussion. And thank you so much for having me here today. 
Thank you so much, uh, Alexandra. And now we will go on to our last roundtable speaker, who's uh, Carrie Sautner. Hello, everybody. And you'll just give me a brief second to get my PowerPoint all together. This is exciting. And I'm, every single speaker has, like everybody else has said, has been fantastic, um, has been really engaging and it just thought provoking. I wish I would have been here every minute of the experience. Um, so a little bit about NCC and then I'll co connect this directly to what Alexandra just ended with. So thank you for doing a lovely segue that you didn't even know would happen. It was a perfect one about community. So I'm Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. We are a museum based in Philadelphia, but we're a national civic education organization. Two seconds about us so you can kind of get our understanding and our framing. So then when you think about how to utilize the tools and the case studies that I'm gonna dive into, you can see kind of where we come from. So of course, like I said, we're a museum. We're also America's town hall. Our goal in every single thing we do is to bring multiple perspectives to the table to have a discourse and dialogue. Um, we teach all about the United States Constitution. So of course, that's gonna center us and ground us. But when diving in the conversation about the founding, about the Constitution, and about almost every single topic that we're debating across our country today, it's been really easy for us to find these common threads, find these common grounds and engage in that conversation. So that leads us as the headquarter for civic education and we see millions and millions of students every year engaging in conversation. I was happy to hear all day long the nod to historical thinking skills and storytelling. I got my doctorate in storytelling and my husband laughed at me because he said, wait, you're getting a doctorate in storytelling? Like, don't we know a lot about this already? And I was like, oddly enough, you'd be amazed at the research. And did you know that if you're teaching constitutional law, storytelling is the best way to have your students hold onto the law as well as apply it outside the classroom. Again, makes obvious sense, but that's what we do when we get a doctorate. We do research to prove a point that probably most good teach teachers already know. Um, but we do all of this around constitutional thinking skills. So what is the core question and that makes us look back at the Constitution and say, is it in there? Can they do that? All of those questions, when everything is framed around civil discourse. So um, Abigail, your classroom sounds amazing, and I love it. And I love that your students are engaging in civil discourse. Now, if we can get your students to go out and teach the rest of the world how to engage in that, we'll be doing really, really well. And that is so key to what we're doing and who we are as a society. What we're working on right now is a Civics 101 course and the Founders Library. And what I'd like to share about the Founders Library, I have like a colon after this title. It says colon, not your grandfather's Founders Library. So I wanna like ensure that it's not that traditional idea that you get in your head when you hear the Founders Library, that people like Prince Hall are in there, that people like David Walker's uh, speech and rule, the idea of rule of law and the ending of slavery and the violence of lynching are in there. But also Patrick Henry, but Patrick Henry speaking about the hypocriticalness of himself being an enslaver and bringing to light these key people that you would expect in the Founders Library, but ensuring that you're hearing resources from them to understand that moment in time and what they thought of themselves and the hypocrisy of enslavement in America when we're fighting a war for independence. Now, the wrapping kind of core piece around this today was about civic virtue and this balance between identity and civic virtue. The, the, uh, the we and we the people and then the I of the individual. And when I pulled this up and we've talked about this so often at the Constitution Center, I'm not gonna lie, I had a lot of problems of what to pick because every single thing in the constitution is balancing those two things at the same time. And it's not an equal balance. Sometimes it is about the values we believe in and the individual wins. And sometimes it's the balance of we believe in and the collective wins. And when we get it right, all of us move together and bend towards a more perfect union. And so this was unbelievably difficult to narrow it down to say, what is my case study? So I picked two things. I, I narrowed it down just a little bit. And one begins with what Alexandra said, community. You have to build community. 
So, so much of what we do is based in civil discourse and dialogue. And that says, let's bring together a community of learners, of educators, and broaden that scope to ensure we're bringing in parents, community leaders, students, and putting students at the table of authority in engaging in these conversations and leading these conversations. I just really quickly threw up a couple of definitions that we love to grapple with on what does civil discourse and dialogue mean to me? What does it mean to us? And how do we as a group agree upon rules and guidelines that build us together, but at the same time build a community of norms and practice that engage and explore the idea of how do we get more voices at the table? How do we get more ideas at the table? How do we ensure that all those wide range of resources that we want our kids to read, hear, learn, and use are at the table. And it's not one collective group or another collective group. So that is all based in the work that we do on civil discourse. Um, we have tons of materials online on that, but everything is about holding two things at the same time. So civil discourse is fantastic, but we also need kids to, ha to have questions, ideas, and guiding lines to practice civil discourse course in a healthy way. And when I say healthy, I mean energetic. I mean engaged. I mean passionate. And I am the most passionate person that most people know. So I absolutely mean with a lot of emotion as well. And I can't come to the table without emotion. Why would I expect kids to? And emotion tells me a lot about how you feel about it, an idea. So I need that as a listener to be able to run with it, engage with it, and understand your perspective. That's just a map of a, civil, a healthy civil discourse going on. And you can see the idea that the conversation is ping-ponging around the room. What we do at the center is we ground those discussions in topics around the Constitution. And we engage in topics that are at odds with themselves. So I thought the best case scenario would to bring up, and that's a big, beautiful First Amendment wall that we just put into the building would bring up the idea of teaching the First Amendment and freedom of speech. It's a topic you can teach over time. It's a topic that balances our constitutional identity on free speech. What can the government do? What can it not do? But also at the same time, the values that we hold around free speech in our country as individuals, as a society. It also brings into the account when we look at history who's been seen as a person that is lifting up we the people or tearing it down. And sometimes when we look at free speech, that can be very eye-opening. For years, the abolitionist movement was seen as a group of people that should have limited free speech because they're tearing down our society. They're going against what we believe in. When we look at major court cases and my favorite Brandeis quote about the only way to get good speech is my more speech, that comes from the Whitney decision. When Whitney was arrested for speaking out against the government, you know what she was talking about? She was talking about ending lynching. So we have to unpack these stories and dive into it and look at free speech and talk about it with our students. But we also get to bring in these ideas of technology, of being a very, you know, we started off in the beginning talking about knowing that there's bias coming in with our resources and our primary sources. Hey, that's the same thing as social media. There is bias. There is misinformation and disinformation. And so I thought when we're having a discourse and dialogue and looking at all these multiple identities that we can hold together of who we are as a people and understand that camaraderie between I and we, we need to understand these core ideas that bring us together and all the multifaceted systems. So I go back to, we do this with educators, we do this with teachers, we do this with students, join us in the conversation. And I go back to this uh, idea of civic virtue begins and ends with the idea of not only people doing what's right and having courage, and sometimes that's political courage, and then sometimes that's bodily courage to put yourself on the line to be in violence and danger to ensure that our country moves forward. But at the same time, we have systems and guardrails in our democracy that need to be shored up to not trust people <laughs> and to also say, okay, we also know humankind tend to lean towards, you know, I'm going to do this for me as well. So what's their systems that we need to shore up as well? Um, and I like to look at this at multiple levels. So, so much to unpack and to dive into. I'm sorry, this is probably super overwhelming and way over five minutes. 
um, but really trying to pull it all together with our constitution and the most important thing to talk to each other and to really, really listen to each other. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you uh, for the terrific presentations, all four of them. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd like to just make uh, one very brief comment and then ask a, a kind of hopefully a connecting question. Um, I was struck in Alexander's presentation about the contrast she made between what she called academic history, that is, the history she studied when she was getting her PhD, and what she's doing now. I take the point, I think she's right, and I think it's an enormous problem, um, especially because of what's happened to the academic job market. I think there are some historians that are still training their PhD students as if they're going to teach at Amherst College. And I think that is malpractice uh, because they're not gonna teach at Amherst College, not because they're not fantastic because the students are better than they've ever been. It's because the entire structure of the job market has changed. There are many fewer jobs in academia, but more jobs in the kind of things that Alexander's doing, which ultimately in my view are more important, but we have to prepare people to do them. We have to move away from that binary of what is, you know, academic training and what's public facing training. So that's my soapbox thing. Now the question. Um, uh, it strikes me that one of the themes running through all of this has to do with this just incredible richness of digital resources. Um, uh, some of which obviously have been produced by the people on this call and uh, some of which have, have happened elsewhere, but just an amazing array of tremendous both primary and secondary sources that you can find with a click of a mouse. But of course that raises the ever hard question of how to utilize them in a constructive and, uh, and, and, and an educational fashion. Uh, and how you do that uh, under conditions of all kinds of constraint including the constraints on the prior background and understanding that the audience has. So I was struck in Jim's presentation where he was talking about this podcast, which I'm embarrassed I haven't heard, but it's on my list. And he said, well, we imagine our listener as somebody who listens to NPR. I'm sure it will shock you because I'm a college professor that I listen to NPR, um, but I have a love-hate relationship with it because it's so perfectly tailored to me. It's like, there was a terrorist strike in Colombia. What will this do to decaf coffee prices? You know, da, 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 da. Right, it's just, I don't like looking in the mirror. NPR is for me. And my larger point is most people don't listen to NPR, right? I do. I'm sure a lot of people on this call do. Most Americans have never listened to NPR. Um, uh, how do you reach them with these, uh, uh, you know, these incredible tools, especially when maybe they don't know that much so I was, I was struck by the amazing work that Abigail is doing, given that her students come in not knowing what the three branches of government are. How, how does she get from that to like a trial for Nat Turner? I mean, the whole idea of a trial, I think, implies an understanding of those branches, right? At least the judicial branch. Um, and and uh, in the case of cartography and maps, I mean, I don't have to tell the people on this call, but we stopped teaching geography about 25 years ago or longer. Um, and so Alexandra has an amazing load because she's trying to share these maps with audiences that often have never been exposed to maps because schools have stopped exposing people to them. So how do we both tailor and use these amazing digital resources to meet people where they are, build on what they know, or sometimes build on what they don't? So the floor, the, the floor, floor is open. I have two comments that I would like to make. Yeah. Uh, the first is that I don't, I, I just want to be clear that I didn't intend any of my comments as like an indictment of um, the academic training system. <laughs> Lord knows there's enough indictments to go around. No offense I don't, taken. I don't need to, I don't need to throw any indictments on the pile. Um, but more just to say that I think that the way forward for a lot of these questions is to be building these really conscious links between interested communities and between communities of expertise and ability so we can work together to, to communicate some of these ideas. And I think that, that that's really the way forward to, for these questions. Um, the other comment I was gonna make is, is, is yeah, I mean, that's, that's also the answer for how do we try to make um, these digital things more accessible, I guess. So Argo, we're really thinking about it as a kind of a, um, like a second order digital uh, history type of project, because we're not actually bringing anything new into the digital space, right? As it stands right now, you know, maybe in the future we'll get a lot of money and we can help institutions do digitization. But as it stands right now, we're just trying to bring things, pull things that have already been digitized 
into a context that is more accessible and more usable and more friendly to people who are interested um, in those types of documents. So um, certainly classroom educators are an obvious audience that we have that, that we want to be able to connect with as close as possible. But also part of that interpretive work involves reaching out to people who already do have that expertise. So one of the nice things about Argo is that we're working with the Leventhal Center, Leventhal Map and Education Center in Boston, and their whole deal is map education. Right, they, they, that, that's the thing that they are dedicated to. So in my work as project manager, I can draw on their already existing expertise to try to figure out what the best way to communicate these things is. Um, so I guess that's just to say is that, yeah, I think that the way forward is, is, is the creation of communities around trying to answer these questions and trying to link up in, in intentional ways um, the different interested parties and interested communities of expertise um, that are part of this big question of you know, what is the American Revolution? What do we do with it? How should it be remembered and celebrated and understood? Uh, others, uh, others on this, this question. Um, just two things, real quick. One, um, this is why we're building a full curriculum on the Constitution for high school students. Um, that is a 15-week free in full curriculum from beginning to assessment. Because guess what? There is no full curriculum that is given out to our country in any way on the Constitution, and um, not well, not robust. There are pieces and we need to support our teachers in the classroom and they are trying to pick and choose the best resources, but it is really hard for them to constantly go across the country and try to find these tools when they're already stretched to the gills. The only other comment I was gonna say about your point about academia, I don't know if I'd send people towards museums because let's be honest, there aren't a ton of jobs towards museums, but I would love to see our country put as much energy into prepping all of our different fields to maybe one day and then to get an education degree on top of their PhD in American history and teach in the classroom. Because it is an unbelievably needed skill. We've been watching 15 year drop in the pipeline of educated teachers. We need to ensure that teachers of color and teacher, teachers from all backgrounds are coming into that classroom so our kids can see themselves in leadership positions at all levels. So I'm wondering if we need to shift the narrative across the country and say, you know what's an amazing job? You know what part of civic virtue is? Is what people like Abigail are already doing. They're teaching in the classroom and they're helping our next generation be civically minded and engaged and have a voice and agency in this democracy. So just a thought about where they should go. How about the classroom? <laughs> and speaking of the classroom, Abigail, I mean, if, can you just tell us a little bit more about how you're able to do these amazing lessons with people that, by your own description, had such poor preparation before they get to you? Yes, it's incredibly challenging. I mean, on top of the fact that I have 13, 14 year olds at a fifth or sixth grade reading level. And so one of the things I have to think about quite a bit is what exact background knowledge do I want students to have before they engage with a primary source or a secondary source. And so I'll usually have like one slide that says fast facts about like any sort of topic. Um, I also just spend a lot of time thinking about like what exact primary source do I wanna use for the lesson? Um, that takes a lot of thoughtful consideration. One of the things I didn't say is that when I first started teaching, I taught a lot about the Revolutionary War itself and I realized that I wasn't getting kids to where I wanted them to be. Like, yes, we could focus on who the war was between and the fact that black people fought more for the British side, but I really wanted them to just get this, uh, more of an understanding of how complex the relationship was between the founding fathers and slavery and focusing just on the war didn't do that in, the way that I wanted it to. So when I shifted my focus to consider more um, black liberation, black people fighting back, how they never gave up their fight for their freedom, I was able to get students more engaged into any sort of difficult text that I wanted. Um, and it just helped them understand the founding fathers at a, a, deep, a deeper level. I'm not too sure if that answered your question, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, like, how can we find more teachers like you? I mean, and and, and I, I'm saying that in all honesty. I mean, I think that's an that's an enormous challenge, uh, especially at this moment when, 
so many people are leaving the classroom. Um, you know, uh, how we're going to replace those people with whom seems like a hugely urgent question to me. Um, Jim, I was wondering if you could just tell us something about what you all have learned about who's using this podcast and how they're putting it to use. What sort of reactions it's created and what, what we know about what it's doing out there in the world. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. And we've got some preliminary data and we'll probably learn more, I think, as the fall term approaches and people are pl planning their curriculums. But we do know that uh, I have several colleagues, uh, four or five colleagues at the university level who adopted the series in whole or part for their curriculums or for their courses. Uh, and I've been fortunate to speak at a couple different universities uh, virtually with students on on the material. And in part because people are, and I think it's a function of COVID, right? But it's also a function of how we know people learn these days uh, is that sometimes you get more bang from your buck if you give them something to listen to as opposed to uh, simply handing them an essay or handing them a, a monograph. Uh, and uh, the same holds true with the high school level. Certainly we've had some colleagues who have assigned it in, in, the, in the high school level setting as well. But it gets back to the larger point we were just talking about, about the problem uh, and the opportunity of the ubiquity of digital sources. I mean, it's it's like a gold mine, but also you're drinking from a fire hose. And so, you know, in the, the role of the educator, you've got to find a way to kind of mediate that for the intended audience. And so as we were thinking about the podcast, uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the dreadful nature of the academic job market, I could draw on my, my uh, tools as a traditional historian to make those choices on the audience's behalf so that, you know, we weren't simply replicating or, or telling them something they already knew, but in some ways subvert their expectations. But then, you know, my, my colleague Jeanette, who is a proper public historian could bring those skills to bear to uh, 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 blunt some of the, the more academic -y things I was trying to sneak in there. And, and uh, so that we could uh, produce something that was at once robust and makes use of all this wonderful material, but also serves a larger audience and uh, can be used in multiple ways uh, uh, on that part. So, so this I'm very curious about, since we have such an illustrious group of scholars here that come from so many different places, literally and figuratively. I'm wondering um, it, it, uh, what, what you think the big thing is that audiences miss about the American Revolution. And it could be more than one thing, but uh, if you could just snap your fingers and you could have people get one thing that you think they're not getting, and it would be as simple as snapping your fingers, which it never is. Uh, what would it be? What would the thing, uh, either the theme, uh, the event, the idea, the tension, whatever it might be, um, what would you want people to get that you think they're not getting? I would just say very quickly, just to speak back to Jess's presentation, I, uh, which I wholeheartedly uh, agree with, with the way she's framing it, but I would say, you know, the American Revolution is a multi-level civil war that reshapes the British Atlantic world in ways that were intended and not intended. And, you know, it, it gets lost in this idea of the founding narrative. It's really a violent and chaotic war on, on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. um, uh, others, just through your experience interacting with students and other, other publics, um, what do you think that about this era that we're, that we're not getting? I mean, uh, to echo Jim by uh, drawing attention back to Jess's presentation. Yeah, um, those those kinds of I'm from Nova Scotia and just the idea that there there's a war and there's a story and there's an importance beyond just the 13 colonies and that zoomed out level that does take it beyond that hyper focused, um, you know, march towards the American nation state. That is if, if I could snap my fingers, that is what I would want. Um, there's a separate question about like, is that the most like useful and important thing? Um, I think it is, but I think there is a, like a, you know, a debate that could be had there, but. And, and, and then when audiences, I mean, look, I'm a historian, right? But I also write for newspapers, right? So I'm, I'm familiar with, let's just say a little bit of a gap between what professors find cool and what some other people might find cool. I, I, this is I what I worry about. I take what Jim and Alexander said very seriously. And I think that is what's cool about the American Revolution. It's a global event. It involves not just you know, British North America, but really the whole world as it was conceptualized then, which was changing at the same time. But like, what are you saying when somebody on the other end says, yeah, and so what? Okay, right? 
yeah, Nova Scotia stays in the empire, you know, 13 colonies of Joan. Like, and? Like, why, why should I care about that? And I say that as somebody who does, right? But who also hears audiences that maybe don't. Can I answer? <laughs> yeah. Please. I just, sorry, just to jump in. I mean, I think that it's because these are people who share. Oh, you don't have to pin me. I'll leave again. Um, I, I just think that it's because um, if we're thinking about American constitutionalism as exceptional and we leave out the fact that people who share a very similar constitutional system and principles and history and all the rest of it, and they do something actually very similar, but just a little bit different. I think that really matters for understanding the choices that people made um, where, where they stayed. And so I think, I think the, this is where the broad lens um, I think is really, really important, you know, in, in, in helping think about paths not taken and, and the contingency of it. So that's, that's why I think we should study more Nova Scotia history. I'm with Al. <laughs> and look, I think, you know, to go back to uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the presentation by Adrian, I think that's what those cards at the Rev at the Museum of the Re Re Revolution are trying to do, right? They're trying to get people to imagine themselves in a whole bunch of different scenarios, right? During what, you know, uh, Jim described as an incredibly chaotic and complicated time. And just trying to figure out like where they would stand, you know, what they would even do. Um, uh, and it's, it's often not clear, you know, uh, you know what they what they would do, or you know what any of us would do. I mean, under under those constraints, you know, and, and with those difficulties. And um, we very explicitly, as an institution, have a theory of change that our education department developed that says, okay, yeah, we want to tell all these cool stories because we intuitively feel that this is important. But what are we actually hoping to accomplish via that, right? So, like, why do we want to tell diverse stories? Why do we want to tell complex stories, and so on and so forth? It's because we want to have people be curious about the past. We want them to ask questions of the world, of history, of themselves, of the people around them even just within the museum structure, right? Talk to people, have conversations, and we want them to feel activated to leave whatever encounter they've had with our institution virtually or on site and feel like they can do something important in their communities. That's, that's part of why it's so important to not just talk about the founding fathers, right? But to talk about all of the people who are making decisions at various levels because there's agency within that. And so if we can help people to see the agency that various kinds of people at different levels had in the past, they can start to understand the agency that they themselves might have in the present day. So for us, we've got a vision institutionally, institutionally that we are going to work to ensure that the promise of the American Revolution endures. And for us, part of that is supporting the agency of regular people who see possibilities for positive community change. So that's why we think that this matters. Wow. And so just before, we're going to take a break in a moment. But again, since we've got such a great panel, I mean, this, this event is part of a whole series of events that are leading up to this 250th anniversary thing. And I'm just curious before we break, other than you know, the kind of goals that Adrian just eloquently enunciated with specific reference to the 250th anniversary, I'm just wondering if there's something we haven't heard that you want to come out of that celebration. And even if celebration is the right word, like what do we want that 250 to do? So I would love to jump in here because we have been, you know, going back to your last question and this one too, um, one of the big pieces that we've been discussing and we've been in a month of developing principles of the American Revolution as a part of our curriculum and diving into those big principles, which I love to talk about and get like totally nerded out on. I love that like most students, high school, middle school, elementary, love the social contract theory. And I think that is something that we really need to engage with more because going back to your point, you need to talk to them about what they're interested in, not just what we super nerd out on when we're in a closed room at whatever place we're at. I also love the idea of what Abigail used earlier, just using these images to bring the kids in and they have come with so many skills and can dive into it deeply. And with social contract theory, 
we always do a meme of how it started, how it's going. And it's basically like how it started and it's King George the Third coming in and how it's going and they're basically flipping the ship. You know, and like every high school kid can understand flipping the table because you've lost it. You have completely lost it. How did we get there in 11 years? But going back to the 250 and what this moment, these principles and identities starts to stir up, not just for our country, but for the world, is this, this invention of the people and we the people and this idea. And I know there's that great book, Inventing the People, but I, I keep like referencing back to what what are the people? What are they before this? What are they during it? What are they in different parts of the world? But what is it to us today? Who is a part of the people and who does not feel like they are a part of the people? And how is that connected back to the social contract theory, not just between our people and our government, but each other as a community as well? So I, I think that is something that we can bring from the revolution all the way through. And you really need to engage in that dialogue and making sure, and I can't say this enough, but making sure that when you're doing these conversations, you're not the same people at the table, that you have a diversity of so many different things and ideological perspectives are unbelievably huge because you're not going to know there are people that aren't at the table until you start bringing people who really you know, aren't your typical and aren't your normal. And that's hard and sometimes even more and more difficult work, um, but I think it's important. And, yeah. and before we go, I mean, I, I'm always interested to to uh, um, to Carrie's last comment, like who who we're listening to and who we're imagining part of the people, both both here and abroad, right? I I I thought I think it's it's interesting that in the context of these discussions, one thing that hasn't come up is you know the way that um, people in other parts of the world are interpreting the American Revolution. Um, and what it meant, you know, and, you know, the famous examples of Ho Chi Minh quoting Jefferson when he declared independence for Vietnam in 1945, or even at Tiananmen Square, you know, the, the, the students erected the Statue of Liberty, which, by the way, had a Chinese face. It's an interesting thing to Google. I often, I often share it with my students. So it is American in some ways, also French, of course, but it's also Chinese. Um, and, and just thinking about this you know, of course, it's a global event and it's being described, but what that means is people around the world are interpreting it as well. Um, uh, anyway, thanks so much for this great round table. Um, what we're gonna do is take a 10 minute break and then we'll do some breakout, uh, some breakout rooms. So thanks a lot. Welcome back to the main session, everybody. I'm gonna say something because nobody, nobody, or anybody else is. <laughs> um, John, do you want to carry on facilitating this last bit or Lynn hearing back from our, I think we're just hearing back from our um, our chat room uh, leaders. Correct. I think we could just hear back from people what, you know, what the big takeaways were and then um, maybe raise a couple of questions and think about the future, um, where we're going to go from here. So if somebody, one of the facilitators wants to start. Oh, Jess. Well, I, I feel like as, as often happens in breakout groups, we were just getting to some really interesting <laughs> so. um, stuff when the when the room closed, uh, which is which is cool because now we can talk about it with a group. But um, there was a conversation about sort of getting teachers who are in the classroom, uh, uh, secondary teachers and, and maybe elementary school teachers, I don't know, the, the professional development, the support that they need and, and, and maybe setting up some kind of system whereby they could weigh in and say, if you would have a session on this topic, that would help me a lot. Like this is, um, so the one that came up in our session was on Latin American slavery or Caribbean slavery, you know, that would be helpful in that particular context. And like, we can sort of do shot in the dark guesses in academia about what people want to hear about, but maybe if there was some way to, to systematize it and say, what would help you? And then try and figure out that programming. Oops, let me... Did you hit recording, John? No, it's recording, I guess. I think that's a great idea, Jessica. I mean, I think we're hoping that we can figure out ways to reach out and get that kind of information and 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 act on it. I know Emma's interested in that as well. Um, so I I I think you know 
I know the museum does that. It sounds like the Constitution Center is working on these kinds of things. So I think if we work uh, collaboratively to try to try to deal with that or figure out the kinds of ways to uh, elicit that kind of response would be great. And, I can. Uh, oh. Sorry, Lauren, go ahead. I was just going to talk a little bit about what we we chatted about in ours, um, and then I'll uh, pass the baton to you, Grant. Um, so uh, we similarly to what Jess said, we were just getting to a really great discussion, of course, and then the the breakout room happened to end. Um, but we did have a really great conversation otherwise as well. Um, and I think as I'm looking back through the the notes that I. Uh, jotted down as we were talking, one of the things that really struck me is uh, that kind of situated itself throughout our discussion is the idea of like locations and where uh, we can engage with the public um, and we can, uh, you know, sort of have these conversations we can uh, and, and, you know, sort of um, really work together. And one of the things that really popped up in a couple locations is the idea of using and embracing social media um, but also thinking about how that how that public engagement um, can you know there there's there's a cost with that and there can be a, a, some potential losses with that as well um, if if people are not sort of conscious of the fact that the public is uh, you know potentially stumbling on or engaging with with people who are having maybe more nuanced discussions than they they than is able to be captured in 280 characters. Um, so that's just one sort of, uh, you know, kind of commonality as we discussed, you know, issues of, of public uh, history and, and popular history and, and ways that we can either embrace or contextualize or engage with that. Um, and also thinking about locations and areas and ways to have a healthy debate in, in sort of these fraught times. So uh, with that, I will uh, pass it on to Grant. Thanks. Um, that sounds like you guys are having a great conversation. Uh, ours was also extremely lively, lively, and we were just, you know, right in the middle of it in the breakout room, uh, as it must be. Uh, and we were talking about a lot of what we can do in the classroom, because that's probably where the most eff efficacious way for us to kind of like spread these messages and ideas is through generations of students. Um, there's no, we really had no answer to this, but of course there's the question of like, how do we provide a, a narrative of independent independence to students that's, you know, can be uplifting or encouraging or, you know, morally responsive to their needs, what they want. Um, particularly though, we spent a lot of time um, on a really just interesting discussion, again, no conclusion of, you know, what might be the virtues or utilities of trying to revive or recuperate patriotism um, as, you know, a concept or a value, um, which uh, we can tease out and like rehabilitate in teaching independence to students. Um, so yeah, I don't know, very good conversation. Is it, is there maybe worth, is it maybe worth us thinking a little bit about, um, you know, some of the pitfalls uh, that we might encounter as we go forward whilst we're all together here. Because I, I saw that Ian already put in the in the comments that uh, that some, you know, that the Area Studies Center is, is doing this. And of course, the Museum of the American Revolution is doing things in the Constitution Center. So from from your points of, of view of educators, you know, if what would be a huge, what would be a waste of our time to carry on doing? Um, or to start doing what do, what do you see as like the problems that we would want to avoid as we develop this this project be blunt Francis. are you okay, sorry just to clarify emma are you talking about the project of teaching independence overall to the nation or, or locally or sorry, then yes. flip that civil discourse. So sorry, because we've been talking about all these things. So I'm, yes, and it could be a combo. Yeah, I, I, w I would. You can go for a combo if you want. But I was thinking particularly about you know concluding this meeting uh, and you know us trying to develop this particular project. Um, you know, what would it be a waste of our time if we if we, you know, if we did? Um, what what direction should we go in? In your opinion. 
So I think talking on that small and more immediate scale. Um, yeah. I don't think it's a waste of time, but I would just be unbelievably mindful and that teachers can speak to this better than I can about the, that this year was so hard for schools. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was having conversations with teachers about, oh, all these CRT things and like, and they're looking at me, they're like, Kari, I can't even get the toilet to work down the hall for me. And like, I need to make sure all my kids are alive and in here. And I was like, okay, rolling that back and just like putting it back in the box for a minute because I'm completely clueless about how hard it has been for you this year. So I don't think it's a negative. I just think it's the, uh, the, the universe of so many educators are dealing with and then being nationally attacked. Um, as well. I think we have to be mindful of time, energy, and again, going back to the field being under attack in so many ways. So again, not a negative, but no. yeah, not a, not a no, but uh, this is what we need to know. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's all real. You know, I, I have a book coming out in which I make a plea for this sort of dialogue. And then near the end, I have like a five page section called reality check where I just talk about some of the material factors that, that Kerry just referenced, and they're absolutely real. You know, uh, the average school teacher in this country uh, makes $52,000. They're teaching over 100 kids at any given time. One fifth of those teachers have another job to make and meet. And then something else that hasn't come up, which is difficult to talk about because people sometimes hear it as anti-teacher, which is hardly my intention, but if you're talking about social studies and history teachers, there are a lot of people teaching those subjects in our schools that have studied very little history themselves. Um, and that's an enormous constraint uh, that, that, should deserve, that deserves much more airtime than it gets. I think Francis had your hand up earlier. Did you wanna say something? Oh, I was just going to throw out um, a, a sort of a sort of blunt thing, which is that I, I I don't know I've really appreciated these last two days because I think I, I mean I found everyone to be eminently reasonable and level-headed, and it was such a refreshing um, version of this conversation that is in contrast to what you see on Twitter and all these things all the time. And so I, I really have enjoyed it for that reason. So I would just maybe implore this not to turn into too much of a Twitter-ish kind of projected project and and try to figure I, I mean this is a hard nut to crack I, I don't envy all of you guys trying to organize it but and, and certainly the outreach has to be there which is going to be digital like I understand that but you know we we're talking about how monuments maybe are most effective because when they're hyper local um, and you know Philly is no small locality right it's Philadelphia and so maybe diving into the deepest roots of 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 Philadelphia and how to make this kind of conversation not stupidly nationalized through Twitter, but but locally really meaningful through Philadelphia would be the best way going forward to root this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Francis. That's a really, really important point. I mean, sometimes we wanna do too much and we need to focus on, on the local and developing that. I mean, I think trying to figure out ways, I, you know, my father was a teacher and teachers are so underappreciated and they are so vital. And I think, you know, one big thing is how do we, how do we help them know that their work is appreciated and how can we do some of that kind of thing as we try to work in this larger project on teaching independence? I think that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, there are people who study education here and I'm not one of them, but it seems like compensation would be a, a good start. And it's not one that we personally are able to do anything about, but it just seems like, like the talk of having people get PhDs and then, then go become high school teachers is wonderful. That's exactly who we want teaching our students. You know, if, if they could have PhDs, that'd be amazing. But, but the compensation is always the issue. Like it, it just seems like it, we're, with, we're withdrawing resources from the humanities and we're withdrawing them from schools uh, and, and it's, we're seeing the effects of that. And I, can I add to, on to uh, what Jess is saying, particularly when it comes to uh, teachers, K through 12 teachers, we're trying to be more inclusive and have them be part of these conversations, but also we don't want to, what we don't wanna do 
is tax on their time without compensation, particularly um, uh, teachers of color, because that that's something that we don't want to do. If we're going to invite them, and, and, and clearly we want them to be part of this conversation, but just to be aware that, you know, the the compensation is important for um, teachers of color um, to be part of these conversations because a lot of the times they already overworked and underpaid and a lot of the things like the conversation yesterday was like a lot of them have to like they do all this extra work they have these worksheets worksheets that they have to create and it comes out all out of their own funds um and so i think that that's one thing that we don't want to do tax on their labor without compensation so um thank you just for bringing it up because i think that is something certainly very important yeah, and I was going to say I'm totally behind that, and I think we have to figure out ways to do these things when where we can actually compensate people to participate. I totally agree with that, and um, hopefully, uh, you know, Emma and I will think about that as we try to move forward on this because I think that is a really important point. You know, how do we get people engaged when they're undercompensated? and overworked as it is. So I, I, I totally hear that. And there's room for a quick plug there on helping in uh, organizing efforts. I know there's been a lot of strikes in the last few years with teachers. That's something that should continue to happen. Academics have a lot of thoughts on uh, and, and experience and expertise and outreach capabilities. It's never, too, it's never too late for a general strike in the humanities even, just saying. If I was still in the UK, I'd be on strike right now, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay should we bring things to a close Lynn yes I think we should be because um you know it's four o'clock but we thank everybody who participated today this was a great conversation there were lots of great ideas and um you know we're going to think about how to move forward with this taking into account everything that everybody has said so far so all I can do is just thank you Thank you, thank you so much for being here and being part of this um, inaugural program, this experiment that Emma and I and John and Sean and um, John Pollock and others all envisioned. And uh, Adrian, did I say Adrian? I meant to say, and all the people at the museum and Lightning. So this has been a great opportunity to spend time with you, to think about things with you, and I. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>